is Tommy Nee. Tommy's from Boston. We from Philadelphia area and Boston have suffered gravely this baseball season. Uh, so uh, so, so we, we are licking our wounds together. But Tommy heads the National Association of Police Organizations. Look, folks, uh, I'm honored to be here. I really am honored to be here at the Flint Police Headquarters and the Flint Fire Station 1 to speak to all of you today. And I'm honored to be joined by these national leaders I have just introduced to you. So those of you, and some of you do know me because you've attended some of the national conventions, police and firefighters know that what I'm about to say, I genuinely mean. There's no group of Americans, no group of Americans I'm more proud to be associated with than the first responders of this country. None, none at all. That goes. For my entire adult life, I've been working closely with you. I grew up in a neighborhood, as these guys heard me say before, where you either became a cop, a firefighter, you joined a trade, or you became a priest. <laughs> uh, there weren't much in between. And uh, so uh, an awful lot of my buddies and an awful lot of my lifelong friends are first responders. And I've seen up close and personal the kind of sacrifices you make and the sacrifices your family makes. Every time you walk out in the morning, you put on that shield strap on that gun, you walk into a fire hall, you know, your family knows anything could happen that day. And they do it every single solitary day. And it's so underestimated and so undervalued. So for all your spouses, I want to say, and your mothers and fathers, I want to say thank you. Thank you for what you do. Look, uh, I don't have to tell you that you and your brothers and sisters across America have been going through some really, really tough times. You're being asked to do a lot more, including dealing with terrorism and a lot of other things, being asked to do a lot more and be prepared to do a lot more with a lot less. Now, I don't have to tell the mayor. He and his colleagues all across America have had to make some of the most difficult choices mayors ever have to make in economic times that are as difficult as these for, as these for the state of mid-Michigan and the city of Flint. And the consequences, the consequences of this god-awful recession we inherited in 2009 are still being felt particularly, particularly in local communities. But I'm here to tell you we don't have to accept the hollowing out of America's police departments and firehouses. We can do better, and we have to do better. And I'm here to tell you how we can do better, and we can afford to do better. The President and I believe that the single most basic obligation a government has, it exceeds all that, the single most basic obligation is to keep its citizens safe. It's literally everything flows from that. All our civil rights flow from being able to be safe in our streets, in our homes, our schools, our businesses. Everything flows from it. And that's why. The President and I sat down and, with a, God, a good deal of help and talking to some of our Republican friends as well, put together a jobs bill, a jobs bill that contained only those things which economists would say would immediately cause jobs to be reinstated and people to be hired, and things which our Republican colleagues have voted for time and again in the past. Every element of this jobs bill is something that has been supported in a bipartisan way. And I've served with eight presidents. I've been there for eight presidents. And every single one of them and their administrations have supported the major elements of this jobs bill. So it's baffling. I did some of the morning shows this morning. And I was asked on NBC, well, why don't you sit down? We did sit down. We pick things explicitly that our colleagues on both sides of the aisle have voted for in the past that would actually produce jobs right now. And ladies and gentlemen, last night, the United States Senate, not one single Republican, voted to even allow us to get to debate it. The new norm in the United States Senate these days is 60 votes. We got 51 votes. In the past, the way I count, that's a majority of 100 senators. But under the way the rules are now, the exceptions now become the rule. So there's a filibuster, not even allowing us to debate this subject on the floor of the Senate. 
And ladies and gentlemen, so that's why I've come here. That's why I've invited the press here. We have to go over the heads of our colleagues and go to the public and explain to them straightforwardly what this is all about. The jobs bill we call for provides state and local governments the economic assistance to restore police departments and fire departments to their authorized strength because we need to be able to protect your citizens. Yes, it costs money. This jobs bill that relates to police and firefighters, now excuse my back folks, all you firefighters and police officers, this costs $5 billion. That's a lot of money. But we pay for it. Let me give you an example of multiple. My dad used to have an expression. I'd say, but dad, I thought, he said, Joey, if everything's equally important to you, nothing's important to you. Life's about choices. And there's some clear choices to make, and they're not that hard. Do we restore the firefighters and police officers around the country, or do we say that people who own private jets can only depreciate them in over seven years instead of five. You say, what's that mean? Well, guess what? That's $5 billion. If you said to the guy who owns a G5, one of those really expensive jets that's not commercial, that he can only depreciate it at the same rate that American Airlines can depreciate their plane, that will raise $5 billion. I can give you 50 examples of how we can find $5 billion by having people start to pay their fair share so that all the people can be protected. And let me tell you what that $5 billion will do. And this is something I've been doing my whole adult life. I'm the guy that wrote the crime bill. I'm the guy that literally wrote the cops bill. I don't say it like I, I say it because I know the subject matter. And I say to the press and anyone in here, there is no exaggeration in the statement I'm about to make. It will bring back at least 15 to as many as 18,000 cops who have been laid off. There are 30,000 vacancies <laughs> in American law enforcement agencies, local law enforcement. Ladies and gentlemen, 30,000 cops have been laid off in the last 18 months. I mean, 10,000 in the last 18 months. 30,000 vacancies. Firefighters. Of this $5 billion, part goes to firefighters. The money that goes to firefighters would bring back five to 7,000. Five to 7,000 firefighters have been laid off. 7,000 have been laid off alone around America in the last 18 months. You say, Joe, why do you say five to seven and 15 to 18? Because we put flexibility in this because all these experts have told us what they need. If you don't want a new badge, Chief, you can go out there and use the money for a new vehicle or a new vest or new whatever you need to protect yourself and the community. So ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> we've all been going through some tough times all across America. People say, how can we pay for this? How can we make these choices? We don't have to. We don't have to make really difficult choices. I just gave you two examples of how easy it could be to pay for all of this. Ladies and gentlemen, these tough times you're going through, there's no excuse for it. Let me, and there's those out there who say, well, Biden, you and the president, you know, okay, you can pay for it. Maybe you don't need to depreciate just as fact. Or maybe millionaires should be pay a, per, a, 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 a surtax. By the way, even millionaires think they should pay a surtax. Republicans think they should pay a fair tax. Liberals, conservatives, except the guys in Congress. I'm serious. Not a joke. Look at all the polling data. Well, look, but here's the next thing I usually get hit with. All right, so you can pay for it without raising ordinary people's taxes. Well, Joe, you know, we don't need that many more cops or firefighters. If anyone listening doubts whether or not there's a direct correlation between the reduction in cops and firefighters and the rise in concerns of public safety, they need look no further than your city, Mr. Mayor. In 2008, you know, Pat Moynihan said everyone's entitled to their own opinion. They're not entitled to their own facts. Let's look at the facts. In 2008, when Flint had 265 sworn officers on their police force, 
there were 35 murders and 91 rapes in this city. In 2010, when Flynn had only 144 police officers, the murder rate climbed to 65, and rapes, just to pick two categories, climbed to 229. In 2011, you now only have 125 shields. God only knows what the numbers will be this year for Flint if we don't rectify it. And God only knows what that number would have been had we not been able to get a little bit of help to you. In 2008, when you had 122 firefighters in Flint, there were 411 major fires. And you responded swiftly. Two years later, in 2010, when you had only 76 firefighters, there were 760 major fires, and arson was way up then and now. Let's put this in perspective. Look at cities of comparable size, because people say, well, you know, the city size doesn't warrant it. Let me give you cities of comparable size. South Bend, Indiana, 260 sworn badges. 260 chiefs they got. Pueblo, Pueblo, Colorado, 207. Erie, Pennsylvania, 173. Towns of similar size. Charleston, South Carolina has 236 firefighters. Allentown, Pennsylvania is 206. Abilene, Texas, 160. You guys, look at you guys. It's hard enough to do your job in good economic times. It's a tough job in good times. It's almost impossible to serve the total needs of the community in bad economic times when you get cut in half. So there's no reason why our Republican friends in the Senate and the House who demand we produce 60 votes even to be able to talk about this stuff shouldn't be supporting this. What is it they don't agree with in what I just said? What is it that they don't agree with? And we're going to come back. The President and I discussed it last night. We're going to come back and back and back and make them vote on every single solitary piece of this bill. Let them explain to the American people why we should depreciate jets at five years and lay off 10,000 firefighters and police officers. 7,000 firefighters, 10,000 police officers. Look, folks, as Captain Johnson here said, this is a perfect storm, man. And what a perfect storm is, reduced budgets, reduced manpower, decimated neighborhoods, and a rise in crime. That is a witch's brew. That is a mixture for a cancer in a city. Look, there are a few things everybody knows for a fact. We can argue a lot about law enforcement. But we know one thing. The more law enforcement officers we have, the better opportunity to make our streets safe, our neighborhoods safe, and our businesses and places of worship safe. And the more firefighters we have, the fewer casualties that we have for firefighters. By the way, all the studies show the one reason why firefighters are injured and or die on the job is there's not enough of them. We have a dual obligation, folks. We have, a, we have sort of a sacred deal with these guys. You protect us, and we'll give you all you need to reasonably be able to protect us and protect yourself in the process. Look, folks, this is very practical. Nothing's magical. When you cut the number of cops and firefighters in a city this size, crime goes up and property damage increases. It means that there is a, and there's a burglary in process,